couple of hours. Misha's been here, and you see Misha herself uh, now on screen, and Andy as well. Both of them are the owners of uh, the famous up and coming Misha's Vineyard. Um, before I pass on to Misha and Andy to start the presentation, just a quick one on the operational side of things. You would have known that we have muted all participants um, and it's really to reduce any background noise. So if you have any questions along the way, please type them in the group chat or if you prefer to ask the questions verbally, let me know or uh, let a participant, there's another participant named Crystal Wines, that's my colleague Cheryl. She's, hello Cheryl. So she's the one helping with the slides. Um, let her know or let me know and we'll unmute you and have you ask the questions verbally. So without further ado, I shall hand over the rest of the presentation to Misha and Andy, who are actually both very familiar and have a really deep connection with Singapore. Singapore is like your second home, lah, right? Yeah, so both of them have yes. held corporate jobs in Singapore for over a decade. I, I suspect that they crafted the wines for our Asian palate too. But so without further ado, uh, Misha, the floor is yours. Go on. Thank you, Amy. And welcome, Singapore. Now, um, I see some of you have muted your, or have turned off your video. I'm happy if you want to show me who's there. It makes it more fun for me. So if you want to turn on your videos, then I can see if um, you're smiling and if you're listening to me or whether you've fallen asleep. You. Hi, Duncan. Just seeing you. Much more fun if we can see each other. Otherwise, you guys have an unfair advantage. So I've got Andy here. And um, can you say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really glad you could join us. Misha's going to take you through the first part of the presentation, um, give you a little bit of background, and then uh, I'm going to tell you about one of the wines and then hand back to Misha. So that's kind of been the format. Wine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but before we start, I'm just going to let you take in this view. Now, I am not really standing in front of the vineyard, it's a virtual background, but let me transport you to central Otago. Romantic, Look breathtaking. We <laughs> are down at uh, 45 latitude south, but I'll be honest with you, it's seven o'clock at night and it's actually dark outside here in New Zealand at the moment. So um, it's just a photo of New Zealand. It's not really where we are. So um, as we say in New Zealand, kiora. And uh, let's kick this off with a very New Zealand greeting. And uh, we're going to just about move to our presentation slides. My background will probably disappear, but um, Cheryl, let's um, move into the first slide and let's kick this off. Right, and we're going to watch a video. So I'll let this play for the next minute or two. From a spectacular vineyard site deep in the heart of central Otago, the world's southernmost wine growing region, come some of New Zealand's most acclaimed wines. Misha's Vineyard Wines produce uh -oh. a stunning selection of Pinot Noir and aromatic white wines. Beautiful flavours balanced with freshness. Winemaker Ollie Masters has been crafting the wines at Misha's Vineyard for 15 years. The key to our winemaking style is the balance of the vibrant fruit to the, the cool climate, fresh, clean finish. Texture is just as important as flavour in wine. One of the key tools we use for our white winemaking is some barrel fermentation. Every aspect of our wine business is done under the Sustainable New Zealand Wine Growing Certification. It's really important to look after our land and our resources. It's part of being clean and green in New Zealand. Misha's Vineyard is also part of the New Zealand Fernmark program. And that's a program designed to protect and promote our New Zealand products globally. 
Recognised as a fine wines of New Zealand producer, a classification of the country's most prestigious wine, every Misha's Vineyard wine is a reflection of the spectacular single vineyard site. Discover the range of Misha's Vineyard wines. Every glass will take you on a journey. Cheers. Very good. Have we transported you to New Zealand now? <laughs> okay, let's just move on to the next slide, um, Cheryl. And um, as I said before, kia ora. So um, we always like to say New Zealand is famous for lots of things. Of course, our national rugby team, we invented the bungee, sailing, the Maori people, our spectacular lakes and mountains, and of course, the location for producing lots of films these days. But here's some, you may have something you may not know. Next. Sheep. <laughs> no, you did know about that, right? Everyone knows there's lots of sheep on New Zealand vineyards. But here's what you may not know. 27 million of them. So it's not surprising they end up on our vineyards. Um, and nearly two thirds of New Zealand vineyards use sheep in some way on the vineyard. In fact, um, the top photo on the right on the screen is a mob of sheep from Bendigo Station, and that's the Merino Station um, that we have land. And we actually have about 700 head of Merino that come onto our vineyard and do our winter mowing. So we don't need to get machines out, the sheep do a fantastic job and that's much better for our environment. Less herbicide, we don't have to worry about fuel, um, so there are some wonderful things and we get extra nitrogen added to the soils from the, from the sheep poos. <laughs> um, sheep are used also for leaf plucking and uh, quite a lot of other activities on the vineyard. So I think New Zealand um, is, is pretty unique with our high use of sheep on the vineyard. So let's go to the next slide and just make sure we understand where our regions are. So we have 10 wine growing regions in New Zealand, nearly 40,000 hectares. And um, you'll be interested to see maybe the difference between red and white there. Yep, we're largely a Sauvignon Blanc producer. But that's how we've started. So New Zealand really, it's only been in the last 45 years that we really entered the world of, of wine and uh, our focus has been on Sauvignon Blanc and everyone knows us for that variety. But increasingly, after Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, the next most important variety is Central Otago Pinot Noir. And so tonight we're going to, well, tonight my time, this afternoon your time, we're gonna try some of Central Otago's most famous Pinot Noirs. And we're also gonna try three white wines. Um, and you'll see that Central Otago is not just a Pinot Noir region. You can just see on that, that diagram there that all of New Zealand wine growing regions are around the coast. So in that North Island, you see we've got Auckland, Northland, Waikato, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay, um, the Wairarapa. But actually most of New Zealand's wine comes from the South Island. And of course, that biggest region is Marlborough, and that's at the very top of that South Island. What's unique about Central Otago is we're the furthest south on that map there, and we're inland, so we're the only region um, that is not a coastal wine growing region. So let's look at the next slide and just understand where New Zealand is in terms of a wine producing country. Um, we're small. <laughs> We're about number 15 in terms of um, world production, but that's increasing. So just as a comparison, Australia is something like the seventh largest, um, but actually it's decreasing a little bit. Um, Australia produces four times the amount of wine that New Zealand does. Uh, we're just 1% of the world's wine. But even though um, that doesn't sound like a, a big amount, I like to put it a different way. That's about 2 billion glasses of New Zealand wine. 
that is drunk around the world every year. And two billion glasses sounds much better than just one cent, but that's the fact. We're just 1% of the world's wine. The next slide um, will just show one of the things that um, we're really proud of. Uh, we're the country with the highest percentage of sustainable vineyards. And um, we're all in an era now where it's important for us to know how our food is grown, how our wines are made, where they come from. Are we doing the right thing for our land? Are we ensuring that we're not depleting our soils, but making them viable for the next generation, actually improving them? So we're very, very proud in New Zealand that so much of our vineyard area is farmed sustainably. So it sort of means you can, you can be relieved if you buy a bottle of New Zealand wine. Uh, we're not doing anything to hurt our environment. We have amazing credentials in terms of sustainability. Now, when we flick to the next slide, I'm gonna take you on a flight with me. I'm gonna fly you over Central Otago. So let's go. Where in the world is Central Otago? Here we go. We've got New Zealand. We're gonna zoom on in on the South Island. We're going to go down to the middle of the South Island and we're going to fly around. And what this shows you is the region that I'm from is full of mountains and river valleys and these wonderful lakes in those river valleys. Queenstown is where you fly into if you're going to come and visit, um, but you'll see all these other names, Gibston, Bannockburn, Cromwell, Lowburn, Alexandra, Pisa. Wanaka, and the region where we're from, Bendigo. So you can see around that Paisa, Lowburn, Bendigo area, that's actually just that one river basin. And again, where I've said Paisa, Bendigo, Lowburn, Cromwell, Bannockburn, that area around that skinny lake there, and the skinny lake is Lake Dunstan, that's where actually 70% of the grapes grow. Alexandria is a bit further south, um, smaller region with more boutique producers. Gibston Valley is part of the way to Queenstown. Again, a small number of producers there. And then you've got Wanaka right up the top. But it's between these mountain ranges where we grow all of our grapes and all of those other regions are between mountain ranges as well. And um, that's because we've got protection from the mountains and we've got this sort of subclimate um, within these um, river basins. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll actually do a bit of a close up on our region. So this shows you probably even better um, exactly how we've got um, the vineyards laid out and you can see the areas that are green are the areas that are vineyards between the mountains. So Central Otago has the um, honour of being the world's most southern wine growing region. You actually just can't, you can't grow grapes any further south and as I said before the only continental climate. And you know 25 years ago you may have found one or two wineries in Central Otago now we've got 136 and our region is mainly family owned small producers. The amazing thing about our region, although I said up front, most of what New Zealand does is Sauvignon Blanc, in our region, every grower will grow Pinot Noir and maybe something else, but actually nearly 80% of what we grow is Pinot Noir. And I always think if you've got a region that everyone is focused on one thing like that, um, they're gonna be doing a good job. And Central Otago really has become, I guess, the Pinot Noir capital of New Zealand. Now, don't panic everyone. We're just a couple of slides off pouring our first wine. So uh, let me just get through another couple of charts and then we'll actually be drinking something because that's always what we wanna do. So a couple more things. Next slide will just tell you a little bit about Misha's Vineyard. So we have a gorgeous location on the edge of Lake Dunstan. We have 57 hectares. Um, my husband Andy and I own it and he'll come back and present some Pinots in a moment. And um, we established our company in 2003 and we planted in 2004. So we're coming up to our 
15th vintage this year. So we export to about 14 countries and most of those countries are in the Asia Pacific region. And um, as Amy so rightly said, we actually lived in Singapore for 17 years and we were permanent residents of Singapore. In fact, Andy proposed to me at Raffles Hotel. We got married at Alcaf Mansion in 1994. Um, so we're very much, um, uh, we, we feel like Singapore is definitely our second home. On the next slide, you'll see that when we established our vineyard, um, we had a, a few things that were important. We had a, a concept of no compromise. And no compromise meant let's do everything right the first time. We're going to find the best site. We're not going to take any shortcuts with viticulture. We actually had decided we're going to make, you know, we want to be the best producer in New Zealand. We want to find our best distribution partners, hence why we're with Crystal Wines, of course, in Singapore. And we want to do the best job we can of marketing. So no compromise was our, was our motto from the very beginning. And the next slide, just um, that gives you an example of what no, no compromise actually means. In terms of our um, winemaking, it means everything we do is hand-picked. Everything we produce is from our single vineyard. We crop very low. Um, we try and let the wines have a voice or have a, the, let the vineyard have a voice in our wines using wild ferment. And we generally don't filter our pinots um, so that we're, we're trying to do that sort of minimalist winemaking. Um, and we age our wines, um, particularly our reserves, before we release. And on the next slide, you'll see that um, one of the most important things was really finding the site. And it took two years for us to find um, this amazing site. And you can see all of it there. Um, now that's definitely not taken at this time of year. That's taken when we have lots of green growth on the vineyard. But we actually have a vineyard that goes from 200 meters above sea level up to 350 meters above sea level. And you can see we've had to work with the contours of the land. What's special about this location is we had one of the world's leading um, viticultural consultants, Dr. Richard Smart, advise us on the land. And he actually said to me, Misha, it's the best Pinot Noir land I've ever seen. Buy more. So we were going to buy 15 hectares. We bought 57. <laughs> and uh, he said, don't be a Pinot princess. Plant aromatic white varieties, which we did. So this amazing location faces the afternoon sun, free draining soils, we um, pump water from its pure glacial water that we irrigate our fines with. And you can see we really have this beautiful location facing the afternoon sun. Um, we're really sun drenched um, facings on the vineyard. So the next slide will tell you what we're tasting today. We are going to taste the high note. We're going to taste an older reserve. Then we're going to try New Zealand's um, most well-known grape variety, but with a difference because it's from Central Otago, our famous limelight Riesling, and the Gewurz Tremina, which um, we're sort of known for as well. And I'm going to let Andy um, pour something in my glass, or I might pour something in your glass and let Andy talk to you about the wines. So we'll move to the next wine. Next chart. Next chart. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to put some uh, some wine in there. I know that's disappearing. Isn't that amazing how that background, the, the, oh. top, the whole top of the bottle disappeared there. I'll hold it in front of me. Um, so what we're going to pour is the High Note Pinot Noir. So if you'd like to get your High Note Pinot Noir and pop a little into a glass. Oh, disappeared. Oh. A virtual background is prov proving pretty interesting. With it, <laughs> like, it likes reflections. Um, so what I'm going to do is, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about this Pinot to start with, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of information about Pinot in general. And I think that's that's probably the best um, the best way of approaching it. Um, this 2017 Pinot that you have in your glass um, is actually not the vine that um, that Crystal will ship to you uh, because they've got the 2018 now, um, and this is. Um, this is really um, this is really interesting because both of these wines are very consistent. What I'm going to tell you about in terms of the way we select the uh, um, the barrels to put through 
the particular blends gives us this ability to keep this consistency there. So the one that's in the glass is the 17. And yeah. A little bit of 17, but, but that's probably 18. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the winemaker's notes there, so Ollie's notes, complex aromas of chocolate, dark plum, hints of mushroom, uh, a palette of sweeter fruit flavors. And what we really love about this is these nice, soft, supple, silky, um, gentle tannins that are, are just so nice on the palate. Um, it, it is one of the signatures of our, our particular vineyard, the, um, you know, the style of wine that um, we're able to craft with these really gentle tannins. And that comes from the site that Misha talked about, where we've got this amazing west-facing slope that's quite steep, it's frost drain. It gets a lot of light reflecting off the lake. And the trick with Pinot Noir is the ability to get the fruit ripe, keep the acidity. And it likes to do that by having nice long daylight hours while it's ripening. And that's really critical. That's the thing that is probably the most important of any part of the, um, the production of Pinot Noir. Nice long days, lots of time in the sun. We get sunrise in the middle of summer here. We're getting daylight at 5 a.m. in the morning. And we're still sitting outside in the sunshine at 10 p.m. at night. Um, it's really quite amazing. The, the sun sets and the temperature drops. And what happens is we can go from being maybe around 27 degrees in the late afternoon to about 10 or 12 degrees at night. And that helps keep the vibrancy in the wine. And that's the acidity that's coming through. And that's why one of the things that we're really known for in central Otago is this beautiful ripe fruit character matched with this lovely acidity, Love, lovely freshness. You can taste the cool climate. And one of the things I've always said about you know, the amazing match of wines, warm climate environments are really suited to cool climate wines. Because when you think about it, you're sitting in Singapore, it's probably about 30 <laughs> degrees there now, right? It's, it's probably pretty warm. We're about 10 degrees outside and dropping. It's supposed to go down to about zero overnight. So we're here in the cold producing the ideal wines for you to drink in the warm. It's really, you know, that's the way it kind of works. So this Pinot has become a really, really, um, a really well-recognized Pinot. We do this from a barrel selection. Um, what we do is we take um, our Pinot Noir, we've got eight different clones of Pinot Noir growing at a lot of different altitudes. So we're growing on the front block, which is 200 meters above sea level. We're growing right up through the middle of the, of the vineyard. We're right up to the back of the vineyard. We're at 350 meters above sea level. These eight clones are on different rootstocks. And we've got the same clones growing in different places. So some clone six down the front will ripen about four weeks earlier than the same clone six growing up at the back of the vineyard. We get our oak from a lot of different cooperages in France. So generally we will buy from about six different forests and each forest, the wine um, impact from that oak is slightly different. So the fun part of winemaking is sitting down and doing blending. And we'll sit there with Ollie and we'll have samples from lots of different barrels that he take notes of. And we blend to a style. So when we're blending for the high note style, we're looking for those lovely primary fruits to show through, but we're also looking for those dark fruits. We're looking for those plum, and somebody mentioned on one of the notes, these beautiful, supple, you know, plum flavors just coming through. That's what we're looking for. So no matter whether you're getting the 15, the 16, the 17, the 18, the 19 vintage, style is going to be the same. And that's the thing that's really critical with this. So if we go to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about what actual, uh, what describes Pinot Noir. Oh yeah, Andy, you so, can also talk about the 2018 because what's going to be on sale is the high note um, 2018. Absolutely. So the 2018, as I say, stylistically is going to be very, very similar. The difference between them, 2017 was a cool vintage and that affected yield more than anything else. So we got a slightly lower crop um, and that was, some of that was deliberate. We thinned some of the fruit off the vine to make sure that the fruit was, uh, that was left behind was going to ripen. It produced a, um, a quite an intense small berry and we got some really lovely flavors coming through it that the 17 kind of had, um, I guess a little bit more of those, of those dark fruit flavors, that, that, that plum, slightly more coffee and chocolate showing through. So slightly more darker as a result of that cooler vintage. The 2018 was a warm vintage, but we didn't take a big crop. Again, we kept the crop level reasonably low. And so the 2018 vintage with the warmer conditions 
gave us slightly better skin tannins. So we still got some of those concentrated darker flavors, but probably not as deep as we did in the 17. But what we got with the 18, slightly more spice on the palate. So the 18 is going to give you a very similar style, but with slightly more of that warm climate spice showing through. So a little bit more spice on the edge, slightly more of those um, silkiness in the tannins. The thing with the, um, the warmer seasons here is that we get slightly more skin tannins. So our, our decision about how much we put through whole bunch and how much we de-stem when we're taking the fruit into the winemaking process is determined by the season. Where there is a season that's got a lot of warmth and we've had a lot of sunlight on the fruit, we tend to do more de-stemming. So we take more of the berries without the stalks into the ferment. And that's because that berry is going to have thicker skins it's going to have slightly more concentration near the, the surface of the skin. It's going to have slightly more tannin. And the effect of that is to give you that heavier palate and slightly more concentrated palate without having to bring in the stalk tannins. Stalk tannins tend to give you a slightly sweeter note, but it can give you some green, slightly vegetative character as well, and it and can also give you some slightly dusty tannins. So it is that balance between the two. I think you'll find if you had the 17 and the 18 side by side, you would see slight differences as I've described, but stylistically very, very similar. Um, so yeah, let's take just a, a quick snapshot at um, Pinot Noir. And of course you probably know most of this already. Um, Pinot Noir originated in Burgundy. It comes from um, the, uh, you know, the, the the, the wild fruit that was originally in Burgundy. It has spread throughout the world. It's become an incredibly popular wine style. Um, it was one of the original grape varietals of Burgundy. Um, I think the, you know, the, the naming of Pinot Noir is quite interesting because you know, we still know it as Burgundy when it comes from, uh, from, from France. However, when you start to look at all new world, you know, our, our naming convention has stayed with very much that new world, you know, naming the varietal and um, and we'll continue obviously to uh, to see more places starting to plant Pinot Noir although it is an extremely difficult um, uh, grape to grow. If you go to the next one those typical flavours are the ones that I've sort of mentioned. Um, the, um, the exotic sort of primary fruit flavours and I, my, my analysis of primary fruit flavours with Pinot Noir tends to be that cherry raspberry strawberry so um, strawberry is not sort of mentioned on that list, but it's, it's something that shows through quite well in Central Otago fruit. That red fruit character really comes through. And one of the things that I notice when I, when I get that first sort of whiff off that glass, I can pick up red fruit, you know, and, and there's a variety of red fruits, but it is, you know, Pinot Noir, if, you, if you're in a blind tasting and the first thing you want to say is, is it Pinot Noir, look for red fruits, right? That's the thing that's going to be the giveaway. And then that chocolate, um, slightly you get some coffee flavors some of those darker flavors and particularly from our site is star anise and we get other herb characters as well because of our site so we do show quite a lot of things like wild thyme um, we get really lovely um, edgy spice that, that shows through which is that sort of slightly aniseed star anise um, character and, you know, as you, as you see a Pinot Noir age, and you may see this more in the next wine that we're going to pour, that secondary character starts to come through. And that's what's exciting about Pinot Noir. You can drink it fresh and you can drink it quite young. And yeah, it is going to show as a young wine, but you're going to have all those beautiful lifted fruit characters. Now take that bottle and put it in the cellar. Go on holiday for three or four years. Come home, reach into that cellar, pull that out, and make that the first wine that you taste. And my gosh, suddenly you're seeing some other characters. If you've got a good Pinot Noir, that beautiful fruit still sitting on the top, you're still getting those really lovely lifted fruit characters. But underneath that, and building underneath that is those secondary development characters. That slightly foresty character, that slight barnyard character. Um, some people have some, some other terms that are, you know, probably not. In fact, we did a tasting um, in Hawke's Bay uh, last week. We were up in the North Island, we are in Hawke's Bay, and we tasted um, a wine that comes from the South, but it comes from a very, very small vineyard and it's grown on this very unique little site. 
And the, the immediate description was um, dead animal. Now, it's not exactly the thing you really want to have in your, uh, your Pinot Noir, but the development of that just reminds, it reminded me of my hunting. <laughs> so, you know, quite a different character. But what you, know, what you do find is these just beautiful developments of secondary fruit, um, secondary characters, foresty, barky, you know, slightly mossy characters coming underneath that. And it's beautiful. You know, if you've got a good wine, you've got the lifted fruit on top of those beautiful things underneath it, and you watch that development, it's just, um, you know, it's a, an absolutely wonderful wine. Yeah, and the key is balance, actually. So the balance of the savouriness, we're talking about the meatiness, absolutely. But, yeah, and the fruitiness. Absolutely right. I mean, that's, you know, and, and that's the really good thing about Central Otago's able to get that balance. There are a lot of places that have tried to grow Pinot Noir um, not as successfully, and it's because they couldn't, you know, you can get ripe fruit. You, you can put, you put Pinot Noir in a nice fertile farmland paddock and it will grow fruit, but it won't have the intensity. Vines are smart. Vines are actually smarter than we ever give them credit for. Mm -hmm. So if you put vine into a nice fertile ground, it will grow this beautiful big canopy. Very diluted leaves. Things. Leaves everywhere, right? Shoots of leaves going in all directions. The fruit will grow there, but it won't put any energy into it because it says, I'm happy. You know, I'm going to survive. So I don't need to put energy into the fruit. You put them on our vineyard. You look at behind me here and you see those hills. There's not a lot growing on those hills. You put the vines there and they hang on for dear life. They struggle. They say, I'm, I'm really worried I'm not going to survive here. I'm getting barely enough water. I'm getting barely enough to eat out of the soils. I'm hot during the day. You're freezing me at night. You're really making my life tough. And I'm, so gonna I'm, going, to put, I'm going to put my energy into reproducing. So I'm going to put all the energy into the fruit. And that's where you get the intensity. And what you said about balance is exactly right. You've got to have that beautiful ripe fruit character with the balance of the acidity, the balance of that, you know, that energy that's going in. And when you get that balance, you know, what you get is these, these really beautiful wines. But this is so, a really beautiful. <laughs> really. It's, yeah, and I get a whiff of my strawberry lipstick. <laughs> in, a, in a good way. So yeah. let's do something. Let's move on to the second um, Pinot Noir, which is the, um, the Verismo. Misha's sitting just out of the frame here, but she's quite happily drinking her Pinots. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, she's in hiding. She doesn't want us to know how an alcoholic she is. This um, Verismo is slightly different. So we do, we actually do two or three different Pinots that we do from a barrel selection, which is what I described before. Going through the barrel, selecting the ones that have certain characteristics, blending those together. This we do differently. This is selected in the vineyard. So we have three small parcels out on our vineyard that we farm differently. And when I say farm differently, um, there are things you can do in the vineyard that make a difference to the style that you're going to produce. So we've got three parcels. One is right down at the very front near the edge of the lake. And it's a clone called the Abel clone. It's pretty much a clone that is reputedly stolen from DRC. So apparently there was a bloke who went into one of the vineyards in Burgundy, one of the DRC vineyards, and took some cuttings and he smuggled them into New Zealand. And he took propagations of those cuttings and they are called the Abel clone because the guy that did the propagation is actually named Mr. Abel. And that was many, many years ago, but that was the clone that is mostly planted in our Martinborough wine region. But we have some and we've got it down in our very low corner right near the lake. We have another clone called a 115, and we have it in the middle of the vineyard, and it's on a steep rocky slope, smack down in the middle of the vineyard. And then we have another clone called our clone five, which is classified by the um, University Davis, California, right? And that's right up in the very back corner at the highest point of the vineyard, in our rows one to 40. So those three parcels, what we do is we go through and we reduce the amount of fruit that's on there. So what happens is you've got a vine, it comes up to a head, goes out into some cordons, shoots grow up from that, 
and each shoot will try to grow two to three bunches. Most of the vineyard we keep two. We drop the worst one off, we keep two. That's our fruit thinning. For Verismo, we only keep one. We look at each shoot and we pick the best bunch and we drop the others off so that shoot only has to ripen one bunch. So it puts extra energy into that bunch. The other thing we'll do is we'll pull the leaves off from around that bunch so it gets more sunlight. And as I said before, that sunlight helps to thicken the skins because Pinot Noir is a notoriously thin-skinned grape. It's, it's, it's susceptible to disease. It's susceptible for damage from wind. It's got a lot of things that can actually damage Pinot Noir, which is why it's so hard to grow. But if you can get a little bit more sunshine on there, you can get those skins a little bit thicker, slightly more concentration. And that includes concentration of tannins. So we take that through the normal winemaking process. Small batches, clone by clone, ferment it, put it into French oak barrels. In this case, about 45% of those barrels are new barrels. And we choose 300 litre hogsheads. So we go for a slightly larger format so there's less direct contact, but we'll use about 45% brand new barrels for our Verismo blend. It'll sit there for about a year, and then we'll blend all those three clones together into tank, and we put it back out into barrel as a blend. And we put those barrels down the nice, dark, damp corner of the uh, winery, and we'll let them sit there for a, another few months. When we feel it's ready for bottling, we'll take it through and we'll bottle it, and then we'll put it in the warehouse and we'll leave it sit there. If you try something straight after bottling, it's got quite a, quite a bitey edge to it. It can be quite acidic, it's quite tannic, it's a little bit harsh. But we know that that's going to be the case when it's fresh in the bottle. What we want to do now is let it sit and age in the bottle. And all those components will meld together into a nice, soft, silky, beautifully developed Pinot Noir that has, again, primary fruit, still got some nice fruit on the top, but it's got a much more dense mid layer. It's got a longer mid palate, softer at the edges, silky. And even though this is now 2012, it's still got many years of development to go. In fact, Misha and I, we have, the, we have the benefit of the fact that we have a pretty good cellar of our own wine at home. So we can dip in there and grab a 2008 Marismo out. And we know that it's still got primary fruit. It's still got those really lovely characters to it. But now, as I mentioned, those secondary characters are starting to show. It's got some beautiful, you know, secondary notes sitting underneath it. That's a wine that you can drink now. It's a 2012 is released because it is ready and it's beautifully presented now. It's also a wine that if you wanted to top up your cellar and go on holiday for a few years and come back, grab that one out of the cellar, it's going to be absolutely stunning. So... Um, while you're sipping on that, you don't have to be quick sipping on that because I'm going to tell you a story. Um, so if you want to go to the, um, oops, we had to, I've changed the of some slides. So we're going to, there's a little bit more about, um, just go to the next slide if you can, Amy. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah, sorry, Andy. Quick, no. um, Andy, um, there's a question about um, asking, Mr. Lee asking what's the story behind the name Very Small. So maybe you can. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, Misha, Misha, Misha's going to talk some more about that a little bit later. Okay, so we'll, uh, yeah, we'll right. the slight times. I'm just going to flick through very quickly a couple of things about, um, about Pinot Noir. And, and I've mentioned some of these already. So I'm going to very quickly go through the next two, two slides. I'm just going to tell you quickly, it likes, Pinot Noir likes this moderate climate. It likes to be cool. It doesn't like warm climates. It, you know, it, it just produces very insipid flavors. It likes well-drained soil. The roots do not like to be sitting in a lot of water and we are in semi-desert down here. It is thin-skinned as I mentioned. It's susceptible to disease. It's got a lot of leaves in a very low crop level which is why I'm saying you put it on a valley floor that's all it's going to do. It's just going to produce a whole lot of leaves. You've got to work hard in the vineyard. This is a, this is a great varietal that means you have to have hands-on attention to every aspect of growing these vines. You've got cool nights, you've got warm days, and you've got a nice dry autumn, which is really when you need that, that period of time when you're coming into harvest where everything is nice and settled. If you flick on to the next one, we look at our, our measurements in growing degree days. Um, 
A growing degree days is a day where you've got the temperature above 10 degrees, below 30 degrees during the growing period. And we measure it on the basis that you need around about sort of 900 to 1300 growing degree days for Pinot Noir. We sit comfortably at around about 1100 to 1200 on our vineyard. It's got to have enough airflow to keep it nice and clean. The soils that it likes, a lot of them, you know, the, the famous Pinots come from limestone, but you've also got Pinots that show minerality from the schist rock or from other types of gravels and rocks that are growing, that are, that are around the vineyard. And we have a lot of schist rock on ours and low vigor soils. Don't feed them too much. If you feed them too much, they don't work hard enough, right? Um, and they, they do prefer sloping sites, which is why our site is absolutely stunning for this. Um, very quick look at what you'd match with it. Um, it's, it's really, there is a lot of different foods that you would put with, um, with Pinot Noir. Um, you know, we, we, if you want to just jump forward a slide there, we've got, you know, the standard meat pairings. I think this is the ideal wine for Singapore, by the way. I drank a lot of Pinot Noir when we lived in Singapore. <laughs> it was my go-to wine because it matches with so many things you've got there. You know, it's beautiful with duck, it's beautiful with salmon, it's beautiful with, um, with chicken dishes, you can have it with um, pasta dishes, you can have it with so many different styles of food um, that it's just an incredibly versatile wine. Um, I'm gonna very quickly jump into something that I, some of you may have heard before, certainly the team from Crystal Nile about this, and that's our gold mining. So Amy, if you wanna just jump forward one slide, let me tell you what happened when we started looking at our site. We thought we were the first people to go on this very rough and rugged piece of land. But once we started walking around on it, we realized we weren't. The Chinese gold miners actually came onto our site back in the 1860s to the 1880s for the biggest gold strike that was around in New Zealand. And they worked on the, uh, on the big mines, but also started gold panning on the hills and including our hills. And we found a lot of remnants from that. So we actually um, had those sites fenced off and we've got them gazetted with our Department of Conservation to keep them and protect them as protected historic sites of New Zealand. And we thought that was really important. We also, you know, we're in the sub-region of Bendigo and Bendigo was named by the Chinese gold miners that came across from the gold fields in Bendigo in Victoria in Australia. So a lot of the workers that worked on our site actually came from there and they named it Bendigo because the hills looked like the hills in Bendigo in Australia. The other thing that in, you know, and it's, and it's because a number of our friends from Singapore have been down to our site and they walk on the site and they go, oh my gosh, you guys, this is the best feng shui. It is just amazing. You have a mountain at your back to protect you from your enemies. You have the ridges at the side to protect you from the winds and you have water at your feet to feed your farm. It is the perfect farming position for feng shui. And we also discovered, if you click on the slide there, um, something else that came up. We are on state highway number eight. We are eight kilometers from the town of Cromwell. The vineyard land when we bought it was called Sheep Run 238. Because we have to go straight down the hill, because it's so steep, the tractors can't go sideways on it. We went straight down the hill and it happens to be 288 degrees on the compass. The first stages of planting, when we put our vineyard in, we had 88 kilometers of rows of vines. We produce eight different um, wines in the range in the initial part of it, including a Pinot Noir made from eight clones. And our first commercial vintage was in 2008. So on the next slide, what we did in 2004 when we planted the vineyard, um, did they come up? Uh, we had a groundbreaking ceremony and I went to an antique shop in, um, and you're talking Sheng Street, actually, uh, in Singapore. And um, I bought some antique Chinese gold coins. And under the first eight vines, we put a gold coin to signify, you know, our respect to the Chinese gold miners that worked on that land. We said we're returning the old gold to the land to bring the new gold, which is Pinot Noir. And so on the cap, when you look at a bottle of Misha's Vineyard Pinot Noir, there's a gold coin. So when you when you pick up that bottle, look at that and remember the story. Remember that that's the gold coin planted under the first eight vines that were planted on Misha's Vineyard. And when you look at the label, you'll see a vine on the front and it's got eight bunches of gold. And those eight bunches of gold are the new gold. 
And so it's really, you know, it's an interesting um, way that we've captured um, the history there. Now, the thing, so for everybody that's on this call, the thing, the thing that you've got to remember, you, you, see, you see wines from all over the world. You see lots and lots of different wines. And there has to be something that you remember. It's not just the taste of the wine. It's not just, you know, kind of the range of the wine. There has to be a story that you remember. So the one thing I really want you to remember about Misha's Vineyard Wines, we are the lucky vineyard. And the more you drink, the luckier you will get. So I'm going to hand back to Misha. And uh, she's going to tell you a little bit about some of the other varietals that we have on the vineyard. Um, we might pause for a second. Uh, I finished all of my Verismo. It was delicious. Did people enjoy Verismo? What yes. did you think, Amy? I love it. And I find that it can still age for for. Many yeah. years because I still get a lot of the primary fruits. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the, the color around the outside, it doesn't show too much of that brownie color at all. I mean, you would never expect it was it was eight years old. Yeah. Sandra, yeah. You love the Verismo, smooth as silk. You know, if you saw the description, it was wonderful, sweet, concentrated fruits. But this is really how you should drink Pinot Noir. So I know Barismo is a little more expensive and we will come to what the name means, but um, <laughs> this is really the ultimate of Pinot Noir. And if we could all drink eight, at least eight year old Pinot Noir all the time, life would be um, just perfect. Right, we're going to move to our next wine and it's a Sauvignon Blanc and she's called the Starlet. So I'm going to change glasses here. Um, if you have a Pinot Noir glass, make sure you um, tip a little water in it or swirl a little um, Sauvignon in the glass first just to clean it, just so we can get rid of the, the Pinot Noir. Yeah, Misha, shall we take a picture? We should. We should, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone, before we proceed to taste the wine, let's all take a group photo together. Can we have everyone turn on your video so we can all get a nice picture of everyone raising your glasses, right? Is everyone ready? Okay, so on the count of three, uh, let's raise our glass, all right? So one, two, three, cheers! Yeah, hope everyone got a nice photo. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Perfect. Continue. Thank you. Okay, everyone's got Sauvignon in your glass. Very good. Um, right. Let's swirl this around. This is called the Starlet, but what we're going to do is swirl a little bit. Oh, doesn't smell like Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, does it? <laughs> Smell, swirl. What do we smell? What comments have we got? You're going to cheat and look at the things that our winemaker said, but see if you can come up with anything else. But to me, that really is tropical fruits. You know, if you are um, swirling a, a glass of Sauvignon for Marlborough, um, Marlborough winemakers will all tell you it's gooseberry. Well, I'm not sure what that sometimes smells like. Gooseberry, cut grass, I do know what cut grass smells like. But this smells much more tropical. Do you get the rock melon? Yeah, I mean, especially I certainly on get the palate. That. It's very prominent on the palate, much more than on the nose. Yep. Right. Um, ripe citrus, really ripe citrus. Oh, passion fruit. Okay, let's have a sip. Very passion fruit and pineapple. For me. Mm. And don't just swallow this. If you just put it in your mouth and swallowed it, a little lychee, Sandra. Ah, oh, got that. You know, put it in your in your palate. Do a bit of a mouthwash. Mm. You know, it's just us. No one's going to watch what you're doing. But do a bit of a mouthwash and hold it in your mouth for a minute, and then swallow. I like the mouth feel too. Yeah. It feels a bit slightly, what, velvety or... Viscous. Velvety, yeah. Um, 
so you can see a lot of people, um, well, no, let's go in. I think Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc is very distinctive and it is that very pungent aroma. It's that lovely crisp, um, crisp, crisp flavor profile on the palate. Sometimes the flavor doesn't stay so long. And so this is a very different style. So if you look at those slopes behind me, I've got Sauvignon and um, this is the more gentle slopes. You're not seeing the steepest part here, but the Sauvignon's facing the afternoon sun. And um, actually you can see more of it just there. That's starting to get a bit more into the steeper section. It's actually behind me even more. Um, it faces the afternoon sun and we're picking this when this is riper than when Marlborough would pick their Sauvignon. So we're developing these much riper tropical fruit flavors. We actually also have high acidity because we're further south, but it's a balance. Much riper tropical fruits, so we actually pick this when it's technically riper than Marlboro, when Marlboro would pick theirs, um, but we've got nice high acidity as well. So um, a couple of things. So Amy, you said the texture is sort of velvety. Um, it does have texture, and it's one of the things that our winemaker, Ollie, always talks about. A wine should not just taste nice, but it should feel nice in the palate. And we're really focused on the mouthfeel of the wines. It's the shape of the wines. It's the impression the wine gives on your palate after you've swallowed it. It's a gentle wine in many respects. This is not hitting you with the acid at the back palate and making you go, oh, it's a Marlborough Sauvignon. It's much more gentle, much more rounded. The reason, the, the way we do that is um, we want this vineyard to express itself in the wines. And the best way to do that is we let the natural yeast that is on the grapes start the fermentation process. Mostly Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, you'll pick the grapes. Usually you'll machine harvest the grapes um, because Marlborough is lots of flat um, areas of vineyard land and, and they produce a lot of Sauvignon. So a lot of it is machine harvested. The wine is inoculated and they introduce the yeast and it's fermented in um, stainless steel tanks. We're boutique, so we're doing it a, a different way. We pick the grapes by hand. And in fact, we pick the grapes walking down a very steep slope and we can only pick as we walk down the hill. And then we put the pickers in a mini bus and we drive them up to the top of the hill and we pick walking down again. So it's really a labor of love. We're picking them only at the time when Ollie says, I like the flavors now. So he's making the decision, um, not according to anything other than when he thinks it's the right time. So he really is the master of all the decision making with, um, when we pick. Um, and then when we start the fermentation process, for this wine, about 40% of the fermentation is done using those natural yeasts. And that's called wild fermentation or spontaneous fermentation. And so um, you don't have a lot of control over it. So it's why a lot of the commercial producers don't um, use wild fermentation so much. And we actually do it in very old French oak barrels. But it's, that's the part of the wine that um, gives us this lovely textural feel. So we do also do some of it in the more traditional stainless steel clean fermentation or typical cool white wine making, but we blend the two components together. But Amy, that's what's giving it this lovely, gentle, rounded palate. And it has quite a nice length as well. So um, Cameron Douglas, he's our only master sommelier. Um, he thinks um, the Sauvignon from 18, it's a, it's a fantastic vintage for our Sauvignon thinks it's very precise and powerful bouquet, um, rich, ripe, sweet herbs. He's got lemon and grapefruit, white pineapple. So to your pineapple, Amy, that you could taste. He's got some sour passion fruit. That's a little bit of that acidity and, and honeysuckle. Um, it's just a delicious Sauvignon. And we love people coming into the tasting room in central Otago because a lot of people will say, oh, I won't try the Sauvignon. We know what New Zealand Sauvignon is like. And we almost force them to try it because 
um, not all Sauvignon across all regions is the same. So you need to discover the different Sauvignons. Not a lot is made in central Otago, and this would be one of the very few exported Sauvignons from central Otago. So do people like this? I hope so. Yeah, I think I, um, I a bit. Um, if, if you ask me to just give a one word descriptor between Marlboro yeah. and Central Otago, I think Marlboro, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, I would think I would say it's vibrant, whereas yep. Misha's Sauvignon Blanc is seductive. Seductive? Well, I don't mind being described as yeah, having... It doesn't have that crisp, um, pungent flavour, but it just hits you gently and slowly, so seductive. Yeah. It's got a, a sophistication. And if you go into the next chart, um, it's a little bit um, that shows the ski slope. And um, it, we've got these very, what we call bony soils. Bony soils, because there's not much dirt. It's really just rock. And um, as Andy explained, we don't have a big canopy. Um, this is obviously Sauvignon before it's fully ripe. Um, but these vines have a very privileged life. They, they face this afternoon sun, they have spectacular views of the lake. Um, and it's, um, it's just two hectares we produce. So we're producing less than about a thousand cases of Sauvignon. So we don't produce much of it. If you look at the next chart, in fact, that's just a little bit about um, where typically Sauvignon comes from. And so you know, we go to those Marlborough flavours on the right-hand side, that pungent, aromatic, crisp, um, red pepper, gooseberry cut grass that I mentioned, um, versus left, the typical aroma is more in central Otago. Um, sometimes you can get very sandalwood, like I think our 19 vintage is very much lilies and sandalwood. It's, it's got more of those florals. Um, this is a warmer vintage and perhaps not so much of the minerality showing through, but a lot of times people think that Sauvignon has got more of those Puyfume or Sancerre characteristics. But definitely tropical fruits, passion fruit and pineapple um, are really nice, um, uh, really typical flavours. And you can just see the difference there. We've said 25,000 hectares of a Sauvignon planted in Marlborough and just 37 in central Otago. So not much is made there, but it's special. Okay, so let's um, go into the next slide and we're going to pour the next wine, which is the Riesling. We have two more wines to go. I will keep moving here. You can come back to these wines and try them a little bit later. But as we pour the next wine, it's Limelight Riesling. Yeah, Nisha, I just want to point out that it's, I think it's also interesting for our participants that we are actually starting the tasting with red wine. Yes. And then followed by the Sauvignon Blanc, which, yes. yeah, I think this is going to be enlightening for them to know that it's not all cast in stone, not white followed <laughs> by red, but it's really about the body and the, the concentration, which is why I think that's how you uh, uh, yeah. thought about the well, I'll tell you why. If we, were, if we were tasting Australian wines, generally the white wines would be dry and the red wines would be things like Shiraz, what Australians call Syrah, right? Or Cabernets or Merlots. And they're um, heavier red wines, more tannin. Um, and the, the Australian white wines are generally dry, crisp white wines. So you can try the white wines and then it probably doesn't matter what wine you've had um, before you have a Shiraz or Cabernet, but because they're such big and powerful wines that they'll, um, uh, the impact of the previous wines, that it won't have any negative impact on the, on the palate. For us though, as Andy mentioned, Pinot Noir is a thin skinned, skinned grape variety. It has high acidity, but it's a dry wine. It's quite a delicate red wine. And given that this tasting, um, well, I'm not having food here. You may well have food there um, where you're tasting the wines, but here we're just tasting the wines just on their own. So I'm working from dry to sweeter. And that's why we did the Pinot Noir first. Um, the Sauvignon has a little bit of residual, probably it's about three to four grams. This Limelight Riesling is much higher. And then the last wine, Gewurztraminer, has really lovely 
Turkish delight, rose petal, lychee. Um, so it's more like, it's not a dessert wine, but it's more the flavors you'd associate with dessert. So we're basically working through on what's best from the palate, from dry to sweeter. If we had, if the red wines we had were Shiraz or Cabernet, then I'd be quite happy doing those after. But it's better for the palate to work from drier to sweeter. So let's have a look. Riesling, what we have in our glass now is Riesling. We don't make a lot of it, but what we make is really good, um, particularly on our site. And most of it's grown in the South Island because you need cool nights and long dry autumns. And the, the vines you have right in front of you on this picture, um, heading down towards the lake, there are um, there's some of our Riesling vines. So let's um, have a swirl of this and we'll move to the next chart as well. Yeah. Put your nose in it and, and then we're gonna um, have a taste of it and give it a bit of a chew in the palate and then swallow it and we'll talk about it. So the way I describe this wine is yin and yang, sweet and sour. The first impression you get is these lovely sweet fruits because you taste sweetness on the tip of your tongue. But then comes that lovely citrus. It feels like someone squeezes lime juice on the center of your tongue. So you sort of started with sweetness and then you're finishing with this nice lime refreshing flavor. Technically, this is medium dry. So for those of you that know about residual sugar, this has got 27 grams. If you saw that on a wine label, you would probably go, oh, I don't want to try that wine. It's way too sweet. But this is not, this is not sweet. What do you think? What do people think of the, the flavors in this? Would you think it was a sweet, would you say, describe it as a sweet wine? Yeah, please comment. I think it's, yeah medium dry. I, I think there will be people who think that it's off dry. Hmm. Perfect wine for chicken rice. That's what Diana thinks. <laughs> you know, in our tasting room here in central Otago, um, yeah, good with spice. I agree. Um, Sandra, I'm, I'm absolutely in sync with you. Um, Sandra thinks the taste is not so sweet. The aftertaste is not so sweet. Um, and so it's good with spice. I like it, I always say it's the um, pad thai partner, the perfect pad thai partner, because pad thai noodles, you have some chili flakes on top and then you squeeze a bit of lime juice. And actually this is just a match made in heaven. But um, actually with Crystal Wines, we've done wine dinners in Indian restaurants where we've done multiple courses and actually the Limelight Riesling worked the best partner to a lot of those dishes. I think it's incredibly versatile. And you know, I remember many years from being in Singapore, going to Sammy's Curry House at Dempsey and ordering um, lots of curries and um, you'd always have lime juice or calamansi juice. And um, this is the alternative. I mean, this is Misha's vineyard version of um, lime juice. And so I think in Singapore, we know what the food is that uh, matches really well with lime juice. It's when it you want it to have a little bit of sweetness to take away from the spiciness, but then you want that lovely refreshing flavor. So you'll see lots of awards on this page. Um, chili crab, yeah, Chris, chili crab, this works brilliantly. Well done, that's a good match. Um, New Zealand has got 82 wines currently on a list of the fine wines of New Zealand. Seven masters of wine and a, um, our only master sommelier, Cameron Douglas, got together and New Zealand was the patron of a program to find the best wines in the country. Started off with 40 wines, now it's 82, and uh, Limelight Riesling is one of the fine wines of New Zealand. Um, all the reviewers have claimed it as, you know, one of the top 12 Rieslings. Michael Cooper, who writes the big book of New Zealand wines, um, he classes it as one of the classic wines, which means every vintage has been five stars since the outset. For me, it's just, um, well, here's an interesting thing. Here we are in central Otago and through our tasting room, the most popular wine out the tasting room 
is Limelight Riesling. It's just the most versatile wine. Yes, we sell more Pinot Noir overall because we have a few different styles of Pinot Noir, but this is the most favorite wine out of the tasting room. Let's just talk about why this is, um, has been so successful. So the next chart is just um, what I had mentioned about the fine wines of New Zealand. Um, now there are the, the latest, um, the latest one is I mentioned 82 wines. So this is 60 and 67, but there's now 82. And of course this has been served on Air New Zealand in business premiere um, as a, a featured fine wine of New Zealand. But if we go to the next chart, you'll find one of the reasons why Riesling works so well on our vineyard. I um, actually put these charts initially together for some masterclass we were doing in Singapore when we were looking about the ageability of certain wines. And we were looking at ageability of uh, wines like Pinot Gris, which is a noble wine from Alsace, and we do a version down here. And we were looking at Rieslings. So on the left of the screen, uh, when I was looking at some of the pictures of the Mosel, I was thinking that looks very similar to our vineyard and our vineyards on the right. And again, the bottom, you can see the slope of the Mosel um, and Misha's vineyard. If you go to the next one as well, next chart, you'll see, um, in fact, when I first saw the picture of the Mosel on the top left of your screen, I had to do a double take. I thought, that's our vineyard. And then it's like, well, no, it isn't, but it's very similar. And you can see on the bottom picture some of the slopes um, that um, they have in the Mosel and our, on our vineyard. The reason why we can produce great Riesling um, in central Otago, um, and particularly on our site, is the Mosel has these wonderful slate soils and we have schist, and it's very similar. We're getting wonderful reflections from the lake. We're facing afternoon sun. We're on these wonderful frost drain slopes. We're in climates where we have a big differential between the daytime temperature and the nighttime coolness, which keeps the acidity in the wines. So it's not just visually, they look the same. There's a lot similar in terms of our um, weather conditions, our climate conditions, our soil conditions. Um, so we have a very special site. And that's why, if you remember at the very beginning, I said, Dr. Richard Smart said to us, don't be a Pinot Princess, Misha, plant aromatic whites. They will do really well on the site. And this is why he knew our, um, our vineyard was going to be the right place to plant aromatic whites. So say goodbye to Riesling. We're on the home stretch now. We're going to reach for the last wine, which is Gewurztraminer. How are we doing time-wise? We're okay. I'll keep moving through this. Yeah, we have about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Good. Right. Oh, smell that. Wow. I'm guessing lychee, but I, yeah. I don't know. Yes. Whoa. Not a lot of Gewurztraminer is grown in the world, to be honest, and most of it's grown in the North Island in New Zealand. Again, we're a bit unusual because we're growing a variety um, that you don't see a lot of in central Otago, but it works really well. And generally, um, you can see the bunches there. You can see these wonderful, the color that you get. And this is as I'm coming up one of the um, tracks on the vineyard and I can just see the under canopy um, as the light was shining on the Gewurz. Um, such a beautiful, great variety. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, typical aromas in terms of Gewurz is um, rose petals, lychee, spices. And the warmer the climate, the riper, the richer those styles are. What we actually have is a more linear style, a crisper style. And sometimes my, my husband talks about Gewurztramina as like drinking your grandma's perfume bottle sometimes. It can be overly sweet and rose water and, and really quite a luscious wine. But what you'll find when, we, when you taste this, if you haven't already, is that amazing um, nose and amazing aromas. But then on the palate, you've got those typical Gewurz flavors, 
but then it's not too sweet. It's still quite refreshing. So let's have a taste. Mm. What do we think? Flavors? What do you think, Amy? I get the rose petals. I wanted to say ice bandung. Do you know ice bandung, Misha? Have you tasted that before? Yeah, so I get a whiff of that. It's very nice. And I like that your gourds is not overly oily. Yeah. You know, there are some gourds that are just so viscous or yeah, so, yeah. so oily to the point that it loses acidity. But I get the, the freshness. Surprising. Yeah. So go to the next slide, um, Cheryl, um, if you can move to the next one where we've actually got the gewurz. What I think makes our gewurz very drinkable, um, because Amy, you're right, there can be, when it comes from a warmer climate and it's much riper and richer, it has an oiliness to it and you really need food to go with it. But actually, this has got enough freshness, again, because you think of our position in New Zealand, we're right down the bottom. We're in a, a climate that has a lot, that keeps a lot of acidity in the grapes because it's cool at night. And that keeps some freshness in the wines. And we actually do a late harvest vers version of Gewurztramina as well. And that's also got a freshness that you don't normally associate dessert wine with a, with a Gewurztramina. Um, Gewurz Tremina is the spicy wine of Tremina, uh, originally um, from uh, northern Italy, actually, and the Germans took it and um, they called it Gewurz Tremina, which Gewurz means spicy, so the spicy wine of Tremina. Um, most people associate it with Alsace. And, you know, this wine, um, the, the Sauvignon and the Riesling are all done with that wild fermentation that I was talking about before. So we're actually building this lovely um, texture into the wine by yet letting the natural yeast that's on the grapes start that fermentation process. So this is 2009. This is quite um, a recent um, Gewurztramina. Um, I think it's one of our um, nicer vintages, to be, to be honest. Um, I love that little bit of ginger at the back palate. So for me, in terms of food matching, if we're just doing stir fries at home and I get the wok out and we're throwing a little bit of, you know, ginger and garlic and various things into the wok, this would be my go-to. Um, this is really nice with any pork dish. Um, if I'm just gonna, you know, in Singapore, go and get some char siu from the, from the wet market and, and bring back and have some rice and some roast pork and char siu and, it's the perfect, that's the perfect wine to have with it. You're giving me inspiration. I, I really <laughs> need chas you can work well. I miss it. Okay, as we're enjoying this, we'll just do the last, um, the last few um, slides. We'll move on to the next one. One of the things that was really important to us when we established the vineyard, and you remember that the motto was no compromise, is um, no matter what, the wines are that we're making from our vineyard and we actually produce 10 wines from the vineyard now. I wanted them to be a fantastic example of what they were and so um, part of my my brand um, promise was you're never going to have a bad Misha's Vineyard wine. So um, what always makes us happy is not just a review of one of our wines but um, Michael Cooper um, writes the book of New Zealand wines and he would try every wine that's made in the country and across the range of wines we get amazing reviews. Um, the reviews on the right are from Cameron Douglas, he's our only master sommelier. Um, in fact Cameron sent a message to me today and he said I've just put your gorgeous um, dress circle Pinot Gris by the glass at a restaurant because he writes a lot of um, lists for restaurants. So we're very fortunate that um, our winemaker, Ollie, consistently makes wines across the range um, that get some fantastic, um, fantastic scores. And you'll see on the next slide, um, Bob Campbell as well. And I know Crystal Wines refer to Bob Campbell a lot. Um, and, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of wines made in New Zealand. So to get the highest or second highest rated in the country um, is fantastic. So we'll just keep on moving down a little bit. Um, 
I promised I would, um, so while we've got a picture of the tasting room, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the namings of the wines. My mum was an opera singer. I actually grew up in Australia. I'm now a New Zealand citizen. Um, I married a New Zealand man, so, um, but my mum grew up in Australia and I trained as a ballerina. My dad died when I was very young and I used to go to the theater uh, with my mum and watch her while she was singing side of stage. I ended up not being a ballerina. I grew too tall, sadly. But um, my first, um, my early jobs um, were in the theatre. And I was uh, first as a dancer with the opera, and then I started marketing the arts. It's funny how things come full circle, because in Singapore, we worked in the tech industry. But when we came to naming our wines, we decided to give them a name um, that were these theatrical or musical names. So the first wine we had tonight was the high note. And the high note is a tribute to my mum, the opera singer. And she died the year we planted the vineyard. The second wine, Verismo. Well, here's a problem. If you call your main wine the high note, damn, how do you get, how do you get a name that's higher than that um, for your reserve? Verismo comes from an Italian word meaning realism. And actually the Verismo period in Italian opera was the time of realism. The composers wrote stories about real people, passion, emotion, drama, intrigue, love, death. Previously, they'd um, composed operas that were stories about sort of gods and fairies and fanciful creatures. But the Verismo period is known as the high point in Italian opera. So we've gone from the high note now to the high point in Italian opera. And I always think of Verismo, it sounds, oh, it sounds special. The Starlet Sauvignon Blanc was the next wine we had because she's fresh and fruity and best enjoyed young. She's a Starlet. Limelight Riesling. Um, there's a musical expression or a theatrical expression or like she loves the limelight. She loves the spotlight is what they're saying. Um, so we in English say, you know, she always likes to, to be in the spotlight. You'll say she always likes to be in the limelight. Um, so it's, a, it's got a theatrical connotation. But also that's the flavour you get from that wine. It's that lovely lime flavour, kaffir lime flavour. So it seems like a good name. The gallery, well, let's face it, Gewurztraminer is not an easy word to say. Um, in the industry, we never say the whole name. We just say Gewurz. But we thought we'll make it easy. We'll call it the gallery. And actually there's a gallery in the theater. It's um, the highest point of seating in the audience or it's on the stage. Again, it's the highest point of seating. And you know, I am aware that with Gewurztramina, some people hate that Turkish delight flavor. And they're like, you know, there's, people either love it or hate it. So I thought the gallery is quite nice because if you think about a lot of times people will go to an art gallery and say, I love that painting and someone else will go, I hate it, my child could do better. So it polarizes opinion. So that was quite fun to, to have a name that had double meanings. So all of our wines have got these theatrical or musical names. So um, the next chart, I've just shown you a picture of our um, beautiful dogs in New Zealand. So um, if you come and visit us down in our tasting room, you can meet Bogart and Harlow. That's Bogart as in Humphrey Bogart, who's a famous uh, actor from Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and he's in the famous New Zealand Wine Dogs book. And our girl Harlow, you can see on the bottom right. And quite often in the tasting room, people ask to meet um, Bogart and Harlow. So they're our brand ambassadors. Um, the next chart is, uh, I love chatting to people, our customers around the world. Um, Misha's Vineyard is my personal Facebook. Um, do a friend request or Misha's Vineyard Wines is our page. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, lots of ways to connect with us. I'd love to hear if you've tasted one of our wines and you want to tell me what you've paired it with, that will give me some new inspiration for what we tell people in the tasting room. And the, the next chart is um, just a final thing. You know, when Andy and I started this vineyard um, and we said, we're gonna make wines, we're gonna make great wines. From that beginning to when we finally had something in a glass was eight years. 
And you know, you never know whether all the investment has sort of paid off for an awful long time. So planting a vineyard and creating your own brand is, is a long, scary journey. But um, early on, we were named as one of New Zealand's top 20 wine producers, which was fantastic because um, there's about 700 wine producers in New Zealand. Four of our wines are classic or potential classic wines as, of New Zealand. And that means, I think you have to get to 10 vintages before Michael Cooper would even deem to, to suggest your wine might be a classic or a potent, potential classic. Um, last year, it, we won our local business excellence award. We've got a fine wine of New Zealand. Um, all the things we planned for are happening for the wines, but it takes an awful lot of dedication. We've had the same winemaker, We've had uh, a lot of, I guess, consistency across the vineyard. But as everyone knows, um, you're only as good as your last wine. So I hope, um, I hope we continue to make great wines because I want to make sure we have that brand promise. And everyone that tries a Misha's Vineyard wine will have um, a fantastic experience and a wonderful memory. And if we move to the last picture, my advice is don't visit us in winter it's cold. And that's me in the yellow jacket, our vineyard manager, Michelle on the right, and Aaron, our tractor driver, who's been with us a long time. Um, come and visit when the weather's like this in my beautiful picture behind me. Um, anytime from September to harvest in about April. Otherwise, um, as um, some of the people on this call know, who have been and visited us in winter, right, Chris Lee? Um, it's really cold and um, it doesn't even need to be snowing for um, you guys in Singapore to be freezing because um, we've had temperatures of minus, minus five, minus eight, quite a lot. Anyway, that's it from me. <laughs> Thank you. What's the next slide? I think it's um, the administrative part. Yes, so this ends our presentation, right, Misha? Uh, and yep. Andy, um, thank you so much for being with us today. I absolutely like how you explain your wines. It's very inspiring, <laughs> super passionate. It makes me fall in love with them even more. <laughs> Hope to visit you soon when the whole COVID thing is over. Um, to all our participants, thank you very much for your time. I'm sure you enjoyed the wines as much as I do. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram to receive information on our upcoming virtual masterclasses. Um, we have Misha's Wines on special offer for two weeks. So do visit our website to purchase the wines. And if you have any feedback about our, how we organize our virtual classes, feel free to email us at marketing at crystalwines.com. So, Thank you again, Misha and Andy. Andy, any last words before we conclude the session? No, just keep Singapore nice and happy. I'm looking forward to coming back. Yeah, come <laughs> back. And, and I'm it. sure you miss your chili crab and chicken rice. <laughs> I'm a pepper crab girl, to be honest. So. <laughs> okay, so we will yeah, we'll not hold up the, the participants. So we'll conclude the session for today. Very enriching time together. Um, so yeah, we, participants, all of the participants, uh, you can leave the session at your own accord. We'll just uh, leave this uh, window open until about five minutes. Everybody just, yeah, just go off on your own accord. And thanks for all your messages, everyone. I'm watching all the messages come through. I'm so glad you enjoyed the tasting. Um, Sandra and Abe have chili crab and pepper crab. Damn, I didn't have any food. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in Singapore or New Zealand. Bye. Bye.